Oh, I'll make this short. Um, so parallel medicinal chemistry and new reaction development. Uh, parallel medicinal chemistry is making lots of, uh, many, many compounds all at the same time from uh, a template that will, I'll show you what I mean by template and reacting different monomers onto that template. Uh, the monomer sets are things like aryl bromides, um, alkyl bromides, aryl iodides, heterocycles, things that, um, that we use as these monomers and some of them are more diverse than others. In other words, what I mean is there's 10 million alcohols you can use, but there's only 10,000 alkyl iodides. So there's many, many more alkyl uh, alcohols available. And that's, then you cover the wide range of log P and log D and, and other, fun, other maybe acids or bases so that you want to make as many wide ranging types of compounds as possible. And we're going to look at some, um, how do we use these monomers in new ways that haven't been developed before this so we can make better compounds. And that's what, uh, that's what this talk is going to be about. So when you're making compounds uh, for medicinal chemistry, there's typically three different ways to make these, the three different types of chemistry that we do. One is the very first time we make a, a, a lead, what we call a lead compound, which is so the first compound that we find that hits a certain enzyme. So in this case, it may be this amide. And this is, these are actual compounds that I'll, I can talk about later on. Um, you want to make uh, this compound, which is a MAP4K4 inhibitor, which is for, um, in, uh, we were looking at this in for heart disease. Um, first one we made, we want to make it as quickly as possible. The next one is, we want to change this core. We want to try many, many different things. We want to try many things out here and many things out here. So we want to do our chemistry very quickly and efficiently, and that's what PMC is, is doing our chemistry very efficiently. Maybe we do, um, at the very end, we put in some diversity, or we use our monomers for diversity. We use bulk intermediates. For instance, I'll show you a couple of intermediates that we used in the, in the core here. Um, how do you know whether your, your reaction is going to go here or here? You, you know, what's the order of reactions? So th these are some of the things that, you, that we have to figure out when you're going to do fast, efficient, parallel uh, chemistry, make lots of analogs. And then towards the end of the sequence, you get to where you pick one compound, and that's the one compound that you make on a lot of, this is 300 grams is our first initial, before we give it to the, the development, is we make about 300 grams, and we test it for safety. And then, um, and then process chemistry will go and make kilograms of these compounds. So we want to give them a safe and efficient, high purity synthesis. So those are the three types of synthesis that we do in, in the discovery labs. And the, the one we do the most, oh, excuse me, is, um, is this analog, which is like the PM, making lots and lots of different types. And that's where we're going to go today. This compound is in the clinic uh, for diabetes and NASH. Again, a second, a second compound for NASH. This one is a little bit different though. And that one is, um, I don't know if you guys have, in the US we have this stuff called high fructose corn syrup. It's in many, many foods and candies and sodas and things like that, Coke. It's in Coca-Cola. And what happens is fructose is, is um, metabolized by this KHK, ketohexokinase into fructose 1-phosphate. And what that does eventually it will turn into triglycerides and fat. And, but the problem is your body doesn't recognize this. And so it does not stop. It will not make, it will just take all the fructose and make it into fat. And we, and we want to stop that right there because that it won't, it, your body normally would try and, and divert, if you take glucose, it will divert it to some other pathways, but it doesn't do that with fructose. And so you, all the fructose you eat will become fat. And so we want to stop that by inhibiting this enzyme here. And so this one, like I said, be, like the other compound we have, this one is also a breakthrough designation and is in phase two. And hopefully this one will get into, uh, into phase three and approved very quickly. Um, it's a quite simple molecule um, where there's, this is what we call a template. So this is it's functionalized for uh, reaction here at, the, at these two chlorines. 
And what, how you put this compound together is you, you come in with this, this amine B and tax A at this site first. And then you bring in, then after that's done, you bring in compound C and you attack it at this point here and you end up with this compound after you hydrolyze the ester. It's a very simple process. I mean, this, this compound, is, this piece here is the hardest part to make and it's not, we've figured out a pretty good way to make that. But the key is you have a, a core template that has sites for reaction and you have, you have uh, monomers that you then bring in and react and make your compound. So we've made, you see here the same way, you have chlorine and chlorine and you bring in these, these amines, one and then two. And as you make, as you functionalize further and further and the compounds go from, you get better and better and better. And then um, the difference between this compound, which is very potent, and this compound is they just, they changed out uh, a couple of things here. They put this nitrogen in here and got rid of the alcohol up here. And those were for, like I mentioned before, permeability reasons and things like that. But I don't have time to go into that. But this is, it, it was very quickly, and this, this, this was almost done as a process very quickly through parallel chemistry. How did we do that? And that was, um, so you, like I said, you come in with an SNAR. The first SNAR gives you this compound. And the second SNAR does this, gives you this amine. So there we are, we've got our compounds. You can also, if you want to, like we have an ester out here now, so you, if you, the first one has an ester as part of its, this being a monomer, and the, the L is a linker, R is, R is, could be anything. And so this is what I mean by diversity. There's many, many different molecules that have an N, that have an amine, and an ester and something in between. It could be anything. It could be a phenyl ring, could be a, me a methylene, could be amino acid. There's millions of these things. So how, you know, we want to pick the right ones and we use some of the models that Yuri uses for predicting to say which ones would be better and more in line with the clearance and um, absorption properties that we want. And then we pick maybe a hundred of these and we go and make a hundred of these all at once and then we bring in maybe another hundred amines on this side and we do the same analysis and we make you know a thousand compounds this way or if we want to change the reactivity we want to do the top we want to do the top one first you can bring in this uh, uh, thiomethane here and attack at this carbon here at this uh, chlorine here and then the second reaction would give this topamine. This one can be oxidized to SO2. And then that will leave and through SNAR to give here. This way you can do this one first and this one second as opposed to here where the reactivity is reversed. And this is what I mean by using chemistry to, um, to change the selectivity of the reactivity that we, uh, of the reactions that we are using. So most of the compounds for this project were made in exactly this fashion and made very quickly because the, the, the chemistry allowed it to be what we call parallel enabled. It was ready for parallel chemistry. So they moved through this very quickly and spent only about a year before they found this compound. So this is, that's how quick this can happen versus some of the other projects I've been on which are 10, 15 years sometimes. So what is parallel medicinal chemistry? Um, like I said, it's a synthesis of many projects at once. You can go multiple vectors at the same time. Um, you do the, everything at this higher speed. We need a template, we need lots of monomers, and we need robust synthetic reactions. And what that means is reactions you can use that are tolerant of many different groups. Ones that can, you can do, maybe you can't, you don't want to do, set up a, a hundred reactions under, under nitrogen. You want to have reactions that you can set up in the air. We want to, um, how do you, how do you shake, how, you know, use a, a plate like this to shake 96 uh, reactions all at once instead of putting a stir bar in each one or you use HPLC to purify all your, so it's all, it's all driven by technology. Um, how do you, you know, use, a, use a, a robot with needles to put, um, you know, say DMF in each one of the, instead of having to do it by hand. 
Um, we, do not, we only need a couple of milligrams to test it for biology. So we don't need these reactions to be high yielding. So if you get 20%, that's okay. As long as you isolate some product, you're able to test it. And having a wide reaction scope is much more important than getting a good yield. So what I'm saying there is that and when we measure success in PMC, it's about how many products did you get out. So if you get 20% yield of 80, 80 compounds out of, out of 100, that's much better than getting 80% yield of only 20 compounds. You really want the number of the compounds to be more important than the yield of each compound. So we want easy reactions. We want reactions that work with, other, with lots of diversity. And we want them to be easy to set up. So we can set up hundreds of them at a time. So for instance, this is, this is how we put these compounds together that I showed earlier. We take a, a aminopyridine with a bromine and an iodine on it. And you do one Suzuki reaction here. Then you do a second, and they go in that order. Um, the iodine first, and then the bromine. And you can make this, this very quickly, hydrolyze this ester, and make an amide. You get four steps, and you put in one, two, three. You put in three different groups onto your molecule. So if you, you, know, you can make hundreds at the same time. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, you can, when you draw a compound, its properties are set. If, when you make it, that's what you get. But you don't know how potent these compounds are. There's really not a good way to model how potent the compound is. So you still have to make all the good ones, that you, the ones you think are going to be good. So you, you, build, your you build your compounds on the, in, a, in chem draw or something. You select the ones that you want with that model nicely. And then you pick the pieces that go together. And you make, and you test, and then you do this all over again. And you repeat, and you repeat, until you make hundreds of compounds. And hopefully, it doesn't take you very long. Um, there's many, many simple reactions out there that you can do in parallel chemistry. You can do Suzuki reactions, like I just showed, that are uh, very simple. This is an example if we want to do it, this one the other way around. You make an iodine here first, and then you can explore this side here with Suzuki reactions. Or a reductive amination, where you take an aldehyde, and you can uh, put an alkyl group on your nitrogen. Um, some of the ones that we used in this project here, we made amides, many, many, many amides off of this here with acids or acid chlorides, or we alkylated here with um, alkyl halides. Um, these are some of the SNAR ones from earlier that I showed you. These are very simple reactions that one can do over and over and over again. But not all chemicals look like this. Not all targets are, are as simple as I'm showing you here. There's many, many other ones. Um, one other thing about um, parallel chemistry, it doesn't have to be one or two steps. It can be five or six. So this is, this is one. This is not a, any compound that, that this is just a, a made up example of something where one can do an SNAR with a bunch of piprazines. You can um, reduce your amine, your nitro to an amine, and, and make an amide here. You can remove your protecting group, and then from that amine, you can do palladium catalysis or amide formation down here. You can do uh, direct link amination with palladium or copper, or even nickel if you wish. Um, <clears throat> if you take isocyanides, you can make uh, ureas or sulfonyl chlorides to make sulfonamides. This the, the diversity is available, and you have you know, one, two, three, four, many, many different groups here available to, for you to put onto a, to a template like this. And so you can do, make a diverse template, and you can diversify it even further by doing multiple parallel chemistry steps. <clears throat> so um, how do you choose your, your best templates? For instance, if you want an SNAR reaction, you want to bring in a nitrogen and amine here. You want some electron withdrawing group over here instead of an electron donating group. Now, if you have this donating group that you need that, then maybe you do a, uh, a palladium or copper coupling instead. Um, like I mentioned before here, the Suzuki reactions, you need to know which side is it going to go first or second. Um, if you take a pyridone, you can alkylate it, but will it go on O or will it go on N? Or would you do, rather do an SNAR with an alcohol onto your, 
onto your chloride. Um, this one will come up later where you have a pyridine. Can you do reactions here with bromide or with boronic acids? Um, again, uh, diversity is very important. Uh, so that's the, yeah, that's the, the template selection. Reaction with um, broad scope, you know, do, some, do something with many, many different types of monomers. Preferably a large monomer set. Aryl bromides are much more than aryl iodides. Alcohols much more than bromides and chlorides. And these are stable. Some of the alkyl bromides are not. Um, uh, esters, there's many, many more esters than aldehyde. So if you can do a reaction with an ester, let's do that instead. Um, if that all fails, you can always invent a better reaction. And um, again, a uh, little more about monomer sets. There's, if you open up SciFinder, are you guys familiar with SciFinder? Okay, you, if you um, look up just a general alcohol, there's about 10 million uh, alcohols, something that like, and it, if you do the same search with bromides, you've got over 10 times more alcohols than bromides. You've got 10 times more aryl bromides than aryl iodides. You've got many, many, 5,000 times more aryl, aryl bromides than sulfonates for instance, and I'll, I'll get, you, get you there in a second. And then some of these are unstable. So think chlorides like this, they don't stick around, they hydrolyze in the air. Um, or uh, alkyl halides or sulfonyl chlorides, they'll, you have a bottle of those, they'll last maybe a month. And the next thing you know, they're all degrading and you can't use them anymore. But can we use some of these, can we, instead of using the small monomer sets, can we do the same reactions with the large monomer sets? And that's what we're trying to do by increasing the diversity by using new chemistry. What can we, de what can we develop that will, um, will allow us to use broader monomer sets? And this is where I'm going to start talking about some new chemistry. Um, this, is, uh, this one here is called mesyl transfer, or sulfonyl transfer. Sometimes we call it mesyl transfer. Um, if you wanted to put together an alcohol and, and this and alkylate a, a phenol like this, you can either use a Mitsunobu reaction if X is alcohol, and that's triphenylphosphine and lots of byproducts and it's hard to clean up and get your compound pure. Um, if you make the bromide or the mesylate of this, of this X here, um, those are unstable for storage a lot of times. They will, they will start to degrade and things like that. And sometimes you're, if you make a mesylate of a compound, it may just it may just fall apart before you have a chance to, to use it. So what some folks at Pfizer developed was actually this thing called mesyl transfer, sulfonyl transfer, where you put your mesylate on, on your starting material here, this phenol. You make a, a phenyl mesylate or a, a heterocycle mesylate. And you use the alcohol as your monomer instead of a bromide. And you're able to actually alkylate your alcohol in this method. Now what it looks like is that this alcohol is coming in here and knocking this out here, or same thing here. You see though, that doesn't, that doesn't seem right. And what's actually happening is the alcohol will get deprotonated and steal the mesyl from the phenol. And then that will come back around and alkylate the, the alcohol. So in that way you're able to use a stable a stable template and you can use this wide, widely available monomer and you do, it, you do the reaction backwards. And so you're able to, to form your mesylate in situ and then and get your alkylated product. And this is actually being used on, um, I don't know if you, you might not even know this, uh, lorlatinib, one of our uh, phase three cancer drugs for uh, brain cancer. It's a fantastic molecule. And this, this was um, specifically developed for making that molecule. And it's a wonderful reaction. We use it all the time. And um, uh, so the, the folks from La Jolla, uh, Scott Sutton, and, and did this, the alcohol one. And my, at the time, my, um, my uh, lab partner, Jane Pantelief, she uh, originally from Ukraine, went to school in um, in Montreal, she developed the one with the heterocycles here. So uh, this is how we, we try to change the, the game by using monomers in a different way. 
Um, here's another one, a uh, compound I worked on in, uh, for cardiovascular disease. This one got into phase one, but um, it didn't really work, so we stopped developing it. But uh, what we started doing was making this, this iodo heterocycle and doing a Suzuki reaction here with a bunch of boronates. And uh, sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't. There's not that many boronates available. There's a lot, but not, not as many as bromides. Um, this iodide was very unstable, so this wasn't a very good reaction. Um, so what we did is we walked backwards and said, okay, well, how, would, you know, how do we make this molecule otherwise? And we can make it by, from these beta keto esters. You take these beta keto esters and you make an imine or an enamine and then ring closed with the sulfur uh, portion here. Can we make that better? We can make that better by doing this reaction with this, this enol ether and doing a palladium coupling there with aryl bromides. It's a very easy reaction to get to these beta keto esters. So now we've, we've, instead of using boronates, we can use aryl bromides. And then and we can bring in the R group later on here. So we can use aryl bromides. We can, do a, we can add in the amine later on. So we can make many, many more compounds this way than we could this way. Because this one here is already, the R group's already here. We, we're putting this one in later. So if we take eight aryl bromides and 12 amines, you know, in one day we can have 96 compounds. So that's, this is a way of, of changing the chemistry to allow us to make better, uh, uh, faster compounds. And so we were able to, uh, friends of mine were able to publish this, this reaction here, um, and then we ended up discovering that compound um, as part of this sequence. So looking at your chemistry differently will allow you to, to make many, many more compounds. Um, back to the, the, these ACC compounds, um, one of the things that we talked about, remember I mentioned that we wanted to keep this ketone from, from being reduced or this, you know, what, what about this amide? Can we replace these carbonyls with SO2? What would happen there? Um, what's the difference between SO2 and, and a carbonyl? They both have, um, you can do, you can hydrogen bond to the, um, the carbonyl and the SO2. But the SO2 is, is kind of funny because, especially in a sulfonamide, the, because the oxygens are coming off the same carbon, they repel one another. Because they repel one another, the other bonds are squished together closer. So while an amide has a 120 bond degree bond angle, and a um, sulfonamide is actually less than tetrahedral. It's, on, it's, it's around 92 degrees. So it changes the shape of the molecule also. And that's important for, because just by changing a couple of degrees, maybe your compound binds a little better to your protein. So we wanted to try this out. And how did we do that? How did we do that? If we wanted to make this cell phone from this compound, this was an intermediate from a previous one that I showed earlier today, um, it would take six steps and be 5% overall yield, which is very poor. Um, it turns out this wasn't very active at all, so it didn't really matter. But if we wanted to make sulfonamides at this end, we'd have, we were, the, the state of the art was chloral sulfonic acid, refluxing at 120 degrees with heterocycles like this to make a sulfonyl chloride, which was unstable. We had to use it right away to make the sulfonamides. So these, these harsh conditions, this is not robust. So remember I mentioned you want to have robust uh, chemistry. That means also you could only put the sulfur here. You didn't, what if you wanted it here or here or here? It just wasn't really something that you would be able to increase your diversity. Um, what we really wanted was to be able to make sulfones, oops, sorry, getting going way ahead of myself here, um, from these larger monomer sets, whether they're boronates or halides. How, can we convert these to aryl sulfonates and then be able to make sulfones and sulfonamides from these pieces? Um, because I'm talking to you today, the answer would be yes, you can. Um, and how do we do that? So we started with this reaction here, which was, um, took a couple of years to, to figure out, but using gold catalysis, we were able to take bor uh, boronic acids and things like uh, alkyl bromides, like benzyl bromide, and potassium metabisulfite as a SO2 source, you can make in okay yield a sulfone. 
And we, this was done with um, Professor uh, Toss from uh, California, Berkeley. And um, what's great about this reaction is you don't need to use nitrogen. You can just pull the stuff off the shelves and dump them into a, into a, into a vial and, uh, and run the reaction. Um, it's, an, it's a small monomer set. So remember, boronates aren't as big as aryl bromides. And it uses an expensive gold catalyst. But we were able to make uh, sulfones this way. The yields of this, you know, the, the scope is okay, is not great. You has to use boronic acids. Anything with electron withdrawing doesn't work at all. Um, so, but heterocy some heterocycles do. And remember, yields aren't, we weren't terribly concerned with yields. As long as we get product out, that was, a, that was good. And how does this work? And this is important, this part here is important for the next few slides because um, the information we found out from this catalytic cycle helped us develop more reactions. So the gold catalyst is activated by methanol in the reaction, which it converts the chloride to, to a methoxy gold complex, which then reacts with the aryl boronate to give the gold aryl complex, which we were able to crystallize a couple of them. And this is one of them here. There's the gold molecule there. There's the um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that, yeah, that's the gold and that's the uh, phosphorus. These are triphenylphosphine complexes, not um, t-butyl, sorry. Um, at that point, the SO2 inserts into that gold aryl ring bond and you get this complex here. And then, you, just as described here, and then that's hydrolyzed back to the starting uh, catalyst, releasing aryl sulfonate which then could be used to make sulfones and sulfonamides. It seems like a typical um, metal catalyzed uh, reaction sequence. Except, if you notice, the, the product of the reaction is actually what you want. It's actually way out here. The product of the catalytic cycle is your intermediate. In a palladium catalyzed, say an amination, car carbonylation, where CO is inserted between palladium and your L ring. And then an amine comes in as part of the catalytic cycle. Each cycle gives one product. In this one, each cycle gives one intermediate. And that's important because you can actually run the reaction without any electrophile in it. No benzyl bromide or anything like that. And at the end of the day, you'll end up with a, a flask full of your intermediate. You can take that intermediate and you can split it into 10 different reactions. And you can use 10 different aero, uh, benzyl bromides, or you can oxidize them all to uh, sulfonyl chlorides and react them with different amines. So at the end of the day, you put in a different electrophile and you can get different products. And again, this goes to the diversity that we're trying to get at. So if you take an aero uh, boronate and you can make yourself a pot of sulfonyl, uh, sulfon, uh, sulfonate, and split it. In this case, we used 14 different um, alkyl halides. And they all gave, we got 13 different uh, sulfones out of this reaction. The only one that didn't work was this one, which usually doesn't anyway, so it, doesn't, it didn't bother me. But you get 92% success rate on this reaction because you're able to isolate the intermediate from the catalytic cycle. You can do the same thing with a, uh, a sulf the same sulfonate. You can chlorinate it to make a sulfonyl chloride and react that at the end of the day with 10 different amines and they all give you all the products that you want. And this is what we're trying to get to with developing new reactions for um, medicinal chemistry is being able to use diverse monomers and simplified templates to get to complex products. Now this one, like I mentioned before, it's not very good reaction. It, you need electron-rich aryl bromides. We'd like to have a wider scope. Um, we'd love to use bromides. Remember I mentioned there's many, many more bromides than, than um, boronic acids. And the yields were not great on this reaction. So at the same time, a good friend of uh, both Yuri and myself named Andre Shavnia was working on a very similar reaction with palladium. And his reaction is so much better. It's, it uses aryl bromides, iodides, triflates, and he's able to use with he does add a lot of ligands and a couple different ligands and, some, and a reducing agent and some 
tetrabutyl ammonium bromide. And, but what he's done is basically been able to do the same reaction I just showed you, but he does it with palladium. And he can do the same thing and, and he can isolate his sulfonate right here and alkylate it with, in this case he used methyl iodide, but I'll show you some more in a minute. And he, and he can use bromides and iodides and triflates and he can use um, uh, different solvents if he wants. And he's able to use heterocycles and his yields are so much better. And um, so I was very pleased for him. And this is now what we call the Shavnia conditions. It comes up over again and again and again. This is a wonderful reaction. It's been used for years at Pfizer now since, um, since he invented it. Um, this, by the way, this is a, a alternate synthesis of Viagra, if anybody ever wants to know. Um, so, like I said, he can do his, with Shavnia conditions. At the end here, you've got the sulfonate. You can uh, alkylate it, or you can make sulfones and I mean sulfonamides. Just just set up perfectly for the diversity that we're looking for to be able to use aryl halides instead of aryl boronic acids. Um, it's much broader scope than gold catalysis, much better yields. You can use aryl halides and you can do, like I said, a late stage functionalization of your sulfonate or at the end, at the end of a complex molecule, which makes this very, very friendly for parallel chemistry. So, um, He's, he done, he's just done a wonderful job here. He didn't, uh, he didn't stop there. He tried actually taking basically Bromo Viagra and uh, making more cell phones out of that and did a library just like I showed you with the other sequence and he was able to make all of these um, cell phones and sulfonamides um, very quickly. Um, about the same time we were doing this, there was a professor from the University of Oxford named uh, Michael Willis, who developed this uh, sulfonating reagent called DABSO. So DABSO is DABCO um, that's been treated with sulfur dioxide gas. And what you get out of that is this beautiful white solid that you can just weigh out as opposed to bubbling gas in. Um, you can use this, uh, uh, this white solid, which is really easy to, uh, to um, to prepare, to isolate, and to, to weigh out and things. I got a crystal structure of it here. Uh, you can buy it now um, from, I know Aldrich sells it, but I'm sure there's other ones now. Um, and this has become, a, he's used this to show, in a, very similar to what we were doing, is that you can make a lot of these aryl sulfonates or you know, any kind of sulfonate that then you can go on and do other chemistry with. And so what he was doing was, was, like I said, quite similar to us using his DABSO and palladium. He was able to make sulfonates and alkylate them. He was able to do make sulfonates and make sulfonamides. Uh, he very, what we call green chemistry, instead of using, uh, he's just bleach, and a, uh, like household bleach to make the sulfonyl chloride and then, uh, and then made the sulfonamide. Some beautiful work that him and his, um, his folks have done. Um, and we got to know him quite well over the past few years. And um, we reached out to him and said, you know, we'd like to work together and to expand the scope of this sulfonate work. And so I uh, ended up working with him on using, if you notice, he's using iodides. And I said, first thing you want to do is can we use bromides? So what we did is exactly that. We looked into, into using aerobromides and what we found is this, this Amphos cat uh, catalyst. This is the ligand. The catalyst is it sold as palladium Amphos dichloride. Um, if you notice there, there's also many, many fewer things to add to the reaction now than Andre's condition. So we can actually make sulfonates much more efficiently and quickly and now and um, then we can functionalize them in the same way as we would previously. We've also been able to find that you can make sulfonyl fluorides, which are very important for the, for the emerging field of chemical biology. So these react quite well with, with um, amino acids and form, uh, to form conjugates in, in living systems. So it's very, these are actually much more stable than sulfonyl chlorides. So what we've done though is been able to, to now widen the scope out even further to aryl bromides and heterocycles. And do some late and do some late stage functionalization of some drugs. So I'll show you some of the things that we were able to do. You can do all kinds of functionaliz functionalizations of 
many, many different types of, of arrow rings, including ones that are just you know, silicon based, which is, I, I just can't believe that works. Um, but heterocycles work well also. We had changed the conditions a little bit, but a wide array of heterocycles. And you started seeing these are, these are much more drug-like. The yields aren't great, but that's okay. We're, like I said, we, we, as long as we can make them, we can isolate them. And, um, and what we've done is actually take some, some drugs that had bromides and iodides on them. Uh, this is, uh, this, without the sulfonyl fluoride, this would be um, Zoloft, which is a Pfizer uh, antidepressant. This is a uh, Paxil, which is a, uh, another antidepressant from AstraZeneca, I think, no, um, Glaxo, Glaxo. Um, and then uh, this, is, um, this is an arthritis drug from Pfizer called uh, Celebrex, where this is a, actually uh, a sulfonamide normally here. Um, you can, the reaction works on amino acids, it works on peptides. This is a very general reaction, it's very wide scope. So we're able to put sulfonates in on many, many types of, of, of rings and be able to start making sulfone sulfonamides and things that we never could before. So which is why this is really important um, to be able to, to make all the targets that you might design as a, as a, drug, uh, as a drug designer. Um, Professor Willis continued to work with Pfizer on something that's related but because it's a sulfonate but completely different. Um, normally on a Suzuki reaction you, wanted, you, you can make these bonds quite easily with palladium um, catalysis, typical Suzuki reaction. Um, probably the most widely used palladium reaction at, in the drug discovery industry. But these pyridyl boronates, especially the, the two position ones, they don't work. They're, they're what, when you try to do a Suzuki reaction, you get deborylation as your major product. And if you go back and look at Pfizer experiments in, in over 12 years of data in our electronic notebook, less than 10%, less than 8% of these reactions gave a usable yield of, of desired product. And what Pfizer working with uh, Professor Willis did is they found a way to use the sulfur as not a reactor, but as a leaving group in the palladium chemistry. So just like a boronate, you can now use the sulfonate as, a, as in the Suzuki reactions to give these pyridyl couplings. The, the temperature's a little bit high, and they've come up with another second paper, this Orgolet one, they've used a different catalyst, and they've uh, lowered the temperature a little bit but the, the yields are almost identical with bromides and chlorides. And so you can do many, many more reactions now with these sulfonates that you couldn't do before. So this uh, it's a perfect example of developing chemistry to do uh, for PMC that does, you can do new reactions and make new connections in your molecules. So for instance, this is uh, Chantix, our um, Vrenicline, our uh, anti-smoking drug. So we made a, um, I should say we, not me. Um, the folks that were at, at Pfizer that were working with Professor Willis and his grad students, they made this um, chloride version of Vrenicline and brought in several different pyridyl sulfonates. And in a library format with HPLC purification, came up with, um, came up with these yields, which you know, 9% doesn't seem like much. But like I said, we need two MIGs. That's fine. You know, so this is all done in, you know, one reaction and then sent off to, to HPLC purification. And we're able to do all kinds of pyridyl couplings, just like Suzuki couplings. You couldn't do this before. Um, you could take, this is mepiramine. I, I think it's a antibiotic, but I'm not sure. But they made the sulfonate of that and brought in several um, pyridyl halides, uh, aer um, bromides, and did the same thing and showed that you can do PMC with these new sulfonate couplings. These are things we couldn't make before. So now we've got all of these things in our toolbox for making new, new, um, new compounds. Um, back to Andre. Uh, he was still thinking about sulfonates. He was thinking about aryl alkyl sulfonates. What he did is he, he figured out he, uh, this, this thing called that he 
you start with this rongolite, which is an industrial chemical made on, on metric ton scale for, um, I think it's the soap industry, but I'm not sure. Uh, but if you isolate that alcohol, it becomes a, you can alkylate the, this, um, the sulfur right here with alkyl halides. And then it will, dec this, this whole side of the, all, everything in black will, will when, upon treatment with, with um, bases, will collapse, leaving you with your, aryl, with your alkyl sulfonates, as shown here. And then you can use the same chemistry I just showed you. You can chlorinate them, you can uh, fluorinate them, you can alkylate them, and you can make sulfone, sulfonamides, sulfonyl fluorides in great yields. Again, widening the scope to be able to make uh, sulfur compounds that we couldn't make before. Um, but sulfonates are not just useful for making sulfur molecules because um, a couple years ago along came photoredox. So sulfonates turns out to be a beautiful leaving group for photoredox. So you can do these SP3, S, SP2, SP3 couplings with these alkyl sulfonates that we just, I just showed you how to make using ruthenium and blue light catalysis to get you know, pretty good yields on these um, SP2, SP3 couplings. And uh, my colleague Thomas Nauber I uh, uh, just published on this last year using a variety of different alkyl sulfonates. So not only do we have a method to make alkyl sulfonates, but now we can do some really interesting reactions with them. You can, do, uh, you can take a highly functionalized template like this and do your couplings with, with a variety of alkyl sulfonates. And again, these are, um, these are uh, check one inhibitors, which is for um, a depression and um, you can make in like before HPLC yields we don't really care how much you make as long as you can make some for testing and so we were able to make uh, a lot of these in library format and these are, th these are compounds that had never been made before um, so I've got uh, you know Sulfonates, we've done a lot of work on sulfonates and I'm very familiar with them, so I've talked a lot about them this afternoon because I've been involved in a lot of this work. But, um, you know, the idea of using different monomer sets in different way, in new ways to get more compounds that we couldn't make before, it, it's, it's really been beneficial to our ability to make lots and lots of compounds. One more to talk about really quickly is this, uh, this is a Manishi reaction. Um, it's kind of like a, it's a radical reaction where you, um, the alkyl or radical will be trapped by uh, a heterocycle, generally alpha to the, uh, in the two position to the, the in a pyridine or, or other heterocycle. And this is a reaction that actually you can use, it's perfect for modeling because it's, you do the, a homo lumo com, um, uh, calculation and you find out where, where is most likely for this radical to be trapped on the heterocycle. And it's been looked at in many, many ways by many famous professors from all over the world. And um, oh, this guy, and, and at, in, in industry, this is uh, DeRocco, he's, uh, he's from Merck in New Jersey, he does a lot of wonderful work with Professor McMillan and um, Molander. Um, and Basically, what we wanted to do was, you, instead of using some of these uh, monomer sets that they have here, boronates, sulfonates, can we use something as simple as an alkyl iodide, remember, um, and get new alkyl groups into heterocycles, um, some, using a cheap catalyst and mild reaction conditions. Again, all these PMC principles that I've been talking about the whole day, make it simple, make it broad in scope and make it easy to set up. And um, these guys using a, a photoreactor with um, a blue light were able to use alkyl iodides and a manganese, a, a extremely cheap manganese um, decacarbonate, um, yeah, yeah, um, and some blue light showed that they could, they could put all of these different alkyl groups in that one position, selectively, using 
al alkyl um, iodides, whether they're primary, secondary, or tertiary, and get to these very highly complex molecules in really good yield. Um, now, I just spent half an hour telling you about monomer sets and that al alkyl iodides are not a great monomer set, they're very small. So they found that if they take alcohols and treat it with this, this iodo reagent, iodo gosses reagent, they can make the iodide in situ and use the alcohols to get really good yields of the same products. So they're able to take the alkyls and the alcohols and turn them into iodides in situ. That means you're basically taking this, the biggest monomer set there is and turning it into something useful for this chemistry. And you're able to get at a lot of this chem uh, really quickly. And they just published this with um, some folks from the University of uh, Quebec in Montreal. Um, and this is, this is really a fantastic slide that I, I stole from them. Um, they take four drugs. Uh, Fazadil, varenicline, hydroquinine, and bosutinib, and they take eight alkyl iodides, and they ran, this is exactly what the plate looked like, just like this. This is an actual picture of them setting this reaction up. Those are the yields of each one of those combinations. And for Fazadil, you got reaction here, varenicline, you got reaction here. These are the sites of reaction. The, the only one didn't work. And so this is, this is exactly what we want to see for parallel chemistry. You've got a plate with 32 reactions on it. All but one worked. They could send it off to purification and, and have somebody purify all of those compounds and send them into for testing using you know, simple, simple chemistry. Um, and so this is, this is a, a perfect example of, of what we were trying to do with parallel chemistry, and uh, just, just a fantastic uh, thing. If you guys want to read more, that this, this paper just came out last year. Um, so to, at this point, across the industry, it's probably the, the number one speed and efficiency driver of discovery chemistry at this point. Everybody uses this. Um, and everybody is trying to make new reactions to make things that other companies don't have, which is another point that's important. You want to be you want to be first. Um, it's efficient. It's driven by the diversity of the monomer sets and uh, developing new reactions you know, enables just this wide array of new things that we can make that uh, we couldn't get to before. So that's what I have for today for parallel chemistry. And I thank you for your attention, both in this lecture and the one before. And, and uh, thanks again to, to more. And uh, Yuri, and she's left. <laughs> so, I mean, and, and my first time in Russia, uh, Kazan has been fantastic. I've been here for three days. I've just absolutely loved it. Every, you guys have all been really friendly. I mean, I, not everyone in the city. I've only met a couple of you folks, but I appreciate you, uh, you know, the hospitality, and, and thanks for having me. It's been, I'd love to come back sometime. It's fantastic. Thank you. So, questions? This one was a lot more chemistry. Yes? Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for amazing lectures that you've given because I think we have all learned something from them. But I have a question. Uh, so, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess that you have to synthesize a wide range of compounds and then you test them on some biological objects. Mm -hmm. Well, some test objects. So, I was wondering is there anything that uh, Chem informatics can help you with maybe reduce the amount of compounds you have to synthesize or maybe predict some of their properties. So, is there anything that chem informatics can help you in your work? Absolutely. So, um, it, these monomer sets I'm talking about, they're even the alkyl iodides, for instance, is probably one of the smallest monomer sets. There are too many in that in that set for us to reasonably make. So, we actually have um, uh, programs at uh, at Pfizer where we take the templates and the monomers and we put them together in say like ChemDraw and it and we we let the database pick out all the different alkyl iodides for instance or whatever the monomer is and it makes the virtual compounds and then it screens them against all the all of the um, predictors that we have and we can say okay you know we we want the 
the monomers that will give us a log P of 2 to 3, or a molecular weight between um, you know, 350 and 400, or whatever the constraints we put on there, and you take a set that may be 10,000 possible compounds, and it will give you maybe, you know, say they give you 300, and then you look through and say, no, nah, I don't like that one. Or, you know, so it, it's, I didn't talk about it, but it's, it's an essential first step, because even the small monomer sets we have are way too big for us to reasonably do that on our own. So we, we use it all the time, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Scott. Excellent presentation. Question, um, so combinatorial library design and PMC, what is the difference? Can you explain it? I think, so to me, library design is sort of the act of thinking about what it is that you're trying to fix with the molecules you're trying to make. For instance, um, okay. So maybe in this compound here, when you do, when you give it to a, a mammal, maybe there's some metabolism here, and maybe it gets hydroxylated there, and then it's an ineffective it does, it, then that, that, that metabolite is, is no longer effective. So we want to put something there to block that. So this reaction obviously would be perfect for that to do that. You put some alkyl group and then that doesn't happen. Um, the library design is how, uh, what are the compounds we want to make to, to reach that decision point of have we fixed the problem? Parallel chemistry is the action of actually doing it. As was my, as kind of our, sometimes there it's this, you know, it's the same thought process, but it's, it's definitely, it's, it's more the, the library design is thinking about it and the PMC is actually doing it. It's implementation, right? Yes. It's a practical, yes. that's what I thought. Yeah. Just to make sure. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. May I ask one? Uh, you said about versatile and robust reactions. Yes. And uh, do you have some definition, so some limitations, for example, yield 20% at least, and so on? Um, they're more general terms, you know, about... I, uh, I don't think there's any specific, what is a robust reaction? A robust reaction is something that's good enough for what you need it to do. You know, is it broad enough to use, you know, um, let me see if I can. Uh, so maybe some formal parameters that you are I don't think I, I, at. I, I would never want to put any limits on what, you know, by def defining what something is, really. But if you think about what is, what is robust, so say you, you made this molecule here and you wanted to put um, you wanted to do this coupling here between uh, the piperidine and some aryl ring. Well, the, the conditions you use there, you don't want it to react with anything that might be coming off of R1 or R2. So what I mean by robust is, is um, I'm sorry, what I mean by, uh, sorry, what was the two terms you asked? Robust and versatile. versatile. So versatile to me means its ability to to get along with all the other functional groups that may be in the molecule. You don't want it to interfere. You want it to do just one thing. You want it to, um, and not be affected by any groups you have on the other rest of the molecule. That's where the versatility comes in because it, you can do the react, and the robust is, you know, if you're gonna set up 100 reactions, it still takes a long time. You don't necessarily need to want to use nitrogen or, um, uh, really care if there's a little bit of water in there or something like that. You don't really want to be need. You want compounds that are easy to set up and not be rigorous about, you know, argon and water and, and other impurities. Because sometimes if you're going to do a sequence like this, you may have a workup in between each one. And so if if there's any um, 
if there's any impurities, they may build up over time, and you want to be able to make sure that it's okay to, to you know. So that's a, that's a dif dif difference between robust and, and versatile, um, where you can bring in many, many different types of monomers for yes. versatility. Because there was a, one paper, as far as I know, Gisbert Schneider was one author of it on uh, some other group, probably f from Navartis, and they published a set of like 60 uh, robust reactions, they, they oh. said it. And uh, mm -hmm. so you meant the same thing by robust, like, like those, uh, like Navartis guys. Probably, yeah. I mean, I, I, don't, I know the paper you're talking about. I don't think I've read it. But um, yeah, it's just a, uh, each company has their own definition of things. Merck does a very similar, similar thing where they'll, they'll take a reaction and they'll, they'll try and use it against, they have a set of, for couplings, they have a set of, of bromides that don't work with very many. And so they'll test different catalysts and different reactions against that set to see how robust the, comp the, the reaction is. Um, we don't really specifically do that. It's more of a general term for, for us. Is it, you know, is it broad and sp enough to, to fit our use, what we need to do? It's probably different requirements, but yeah. different stages, right? Yeah, it, there has no right. And so chemistry. process chemistry, when you talk about robust, you need it to work and work well at 80, you know, at, at on kilogram scale, you know, with, in, under many, many different conditions. Whereas here, I'm talking about just the ability to get along with other functional groups. Yeah. And the other, just chemical question, maybe. Uh, usually it is believed that sulfur is a poison for palladium catalyst, and you sh have shown mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. different reactions where sulfur was involved in, uh, with, with palladium. Do you see some, uh, some, some that, that, that catalyst is poisoned by your but you know, we don't, because we're using um, SO2. It's already fully oxidized. We don't see a lot of actual um, uh, poisoning of the catalysts. The catalysts are quite, quite reactive with the SO2 around. And um, the, usually a thiol, like an SH, well, you'll have much more trouble with that. But the SO2 doesn't seem to bother. Actually, that reminds me of um, uh, B pin. Let me find a B pin. Um, Mike, Mike, Mike. Okay. Um, boronic, a boronic acids versus boronic esters. Um, you guys familiar with boronate chemistry at all? Suzuki reactions and things. Well, um, you could, these these um, boronate esters are more stable generally than the you know to other chemistry. Then these uh, you can do other things on your on your uh, on your on your molecule when you have a boronate ester in place. Um, one of the, the next paper that's coming out from these guys. This is fantastic. I love this chemistry. They um, they put allyl. Uh, it's O allyl or no? Sorry, S allyl. And so when you put the palladium in, the palladium will eliminate the allyl group, and then it will eliminate the SO2. And so you can do the same thing. You can make a boronate ester equivalent of sulfur with allyl on here. You can do chemistry on your sulfur ring and then do your palladium coupling at the end. It's so neat. But it, that's going to be even more versatile and robust. <laughs> so. Uh, for example, if it we uh, take uh, template structure, um, but with reacting groups excluded, then could you please tell, does it differ from uh, a scaffold? It's just a, probably just different. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different terminology around there. A lot of times we use them interchangeably. So, uh, um, so for instance, scaffold. Um, so this may be the scaffold, like, you know, um, but a template is something that is functionalized to allow, uh, allow um, 
reactivity reactions. Is that what you mean? Difference between salt to scaffold and, and template? Yeah, but but I mean if we take the structure of the template substance with without any reacting groups, then it's quite the same as scaffold, I think. Yeah, I, I would yeah. I mean I think that's the same. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And the other question. Yes, and you said that SO2 fluorine, uh, sulfonyl fluoride, mm -hmm. could be produced very easily. So, the, uh, is, uh, am I understood correctly that SO2 fluoride, fluorine is a very active group? Probably? No, it's it's actually less reactive than you th than you might think. So, um, when you do an SNAR, for instance, fluorine is a good leaving group. Um, but a fluorine is a bad leaving group if you want to do, like if you have butyl fluorine, it's not going to do a SN2 reaction. It's not going to be a leaving group, mm -hmm. you know, right? Um, but when you're, when you're uh, in sulfonyl fluorides, um, the, the sulfur fluorine bond is extremely resistant to um, to hydrolysis. A lot of that is because fluorine is, is very electronegative, but so are the uh, oxygens. So the sulfur is quite positive. It's almost an ionic bond. And um, you actually need to activate with uh, Lewis acid to get, that, uh, to get the fluorine to, to hydrolyze. Or if you, um, if you put your sulfonyl fluoride on a molecule like this, and you let it go into, the pro into a protein, then just by um, uh, being close in space, things like lysines or tyrosines will react with the sulfur and, and kick out the fluorine because they're already so close to one another. They're eventually, they'll overcome. But you can actually dose sulfonyl fluorides to people. And, and, and there's a couple of drugs with sulfonyl fluorides in them. And, um, uh, but you can't do that with a sulfonyl chloride because as soon as it hits water, it's going to start hydrolyzing. So th this doesn't, hi sulfonyl fluorides don't hydrolyze. So it's, it's quite stable and Just it doesn't cause alkylation of, a, of it can, peptide. It can, but it, it, um, it's, not, it's not that reactive. If you put it in with a protein, it won't just react really with anything. It's, this, was, this was my, I had to get over this understanding as well. I figured it would be very reactive, but it's not. They, in fact, actually, um, we took that amino acid and we added lysine to it and heated it up and no reaction happened. It didn't until we heated it up in DMF at 100 degrees for overnight, for 18 hours, that we got, um, like 80, we finally got like 80% yield. You have to really, really beat on it to get it to react. Yes. So, so you think that SO2 fluorine could be a st quite stable pharmacophore that, as it's also, it could bind somehow to? It, 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 actually, people do use that. They will attach sulfonyl fluorides to things that have um, tracers on them, and they'll put them into, into cells, and they'll react in cells. Then you can follow the, the, the fluorescent tags you know, in, in, um, and things like that. Um, as a drug, it's, it's a little more dicey than ones that I, I think, you, I mean, they do react once they get inside your system, but it's, it's uh, inside the, it, it's a very fine line of reactivity. Okay. So at least it's not as active as I thought. No, 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 they're much less reactive than most people think, yes. Okay. Yes. If there is no questions. Perfect. Thank you again. Thanks everybody, uh, appreciate it.